Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce a session titled Beyond the Binary, and there's a bit of a story for this session. Um, it's going to be presented by Simona Castricum and A.L. Hu, both work in the sort of, uh, sort of um, non-gender or gender diverse area and queer practice in architecture. AL was unfortunately unable to come to Melbourne for this event because they had uh, another, uh, another commitment at the time. Uh, so we thought a little creative about, creatively about this and sent Simona to New York uh, to interview. And what you'll see this afternoon is the product of that. Uh, I'm actually very proud to be presenting or introducing this session. This week is Transgender Awareness Week and the 20th of November is a day of remembrance for anyone who's been killed as a result of transgender violence. And so this is a very important topic to be talking about today. I am the parent of teenage children and in their world, transgender and non-binary is becoming absolutely normal. There is a wave of this coming, and as built environment practitioners and professionals, we need to be aware of that new generation who feel freer to express who they are without worrying about it at all. But we as slightly older, uh, perhaps unreconstructed people, need to think about it more, because it's not necessarily part of our world as we remember it and understand it. So I hope that this session will open our eyes somewhat to that coming world. Thank you. So AL, you work out of New York City. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your practice um, and also like yeah how that kind of works out of out of New York? Yeah, so I, uh, I identify as non-binary. Um, I work as a an architect designer at a nonprofit right now um, and it's a really great place to be because um, there are a lot of avenues that I can come in with design to um, to help communities kind of grow and, and develop yeah. um, there's just a lot of inequality here and I I find that there are lots of ways that I can make an impact yeah yeah so Simona yeah um, what's it like working out of Melbourne yeah I mean like I don't know Melbourne's kind of great in terms of like like there's a really good architectural community there as well there's also a really good musical community so I think from that sense combining those two is like a really you know, it's, it's a really interesting way, I guess, to, to communicate my ideas as well. And I love how those two practices, are, they kind of work together. Um, but yeah, like I'm, a, I'm doing my PhD um, at the University of Melbourne. Um, yeah, and what am I trying to say? That's great though. Is that enough? Yeah. Fine. <laughs> That's fine. Walk right. this way. And just walk this way and I'll, I'll follow y'all. That way? Yeah. Just walk casually. A casual. Casual. Act casually. casually. Like I'm not here. <laughs> I don't know. Act casual. Is that, does it like... Oh, fly casually. I don't know. Fly casually. That's what Han Solo says to Chewbacca. Really? Um... <laughs> There's a new yeah. Star Wars coming out. Did you yeah, no, I saw, yeah. I, saw the, I saw the trailer the other day. So Al, I wanted to open up our conversation with um, a quote that you make in Architecture Magazine or in Architect Magazine, um, 2018. Relying on the trope of the stable gender binary, men versus women, is inadequate to characterise the pervasiveness of sexual harassment that occurs in architecture. Missing from many conversations is the existence and the persistence of men who harass other men, women who harass men, and any mention of transgender, non-binary, intersex, or other gender non-conforming people. So I guess my question is like, how does the binary gender, um, particularly 
that of like a white Western lens of male, female. How does that manifest as transphobia, queerphobia, um, and sexism in urbanism and in architecture? Yeah, so the example that I gave is a little specific to sexual harassment, like within architecture firms. Yeah. But I, I kind of see it as the binary of like men and women only and no other genders is what underwrites the patriarchy. And that's what gives like men more power than women. And that's that power differential that kind of underwrites patriarchy. And then that means that only certain people will get promoted within the profession. And that means that only certain people, like typically like cis white men will be making decisions. Um, and queer and trans and gender non-conforming people have to live with those decisions. Yeah. And it's like, we don't have a seat at the table. And so a really obvious like spatial impact would be um, like there are only men's and women's bathrooms and there's no gender inclusive option at all. Um, and a more like indirect impact is like the people who write policies and codes will write things differently so that those can never come uh, into being. Um, and I think that uh, non-binary genders is what destabilizes that patriarchy, that foundation. And that's what we can, that, that's what starts to get at the root of, of what's wrong with that. Um, I've personally, as a non-binary person, I feel like a lot of non-binariness is missing in the conversation and when you're in public spaces it's like is this actually for me am i actually safe here yeah um it feels very uh, unrepresented and as an asian american person who has to live in this like uh predominantly like cis heteronormative white society um it's like you're almost like invisible or just lost in the entire thing yeah like our fr if our frameworks of violence uh, and, and how we sort of talk about, say, for instance, like street harassment. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we kind of like free up the language, I guess, and, mm -hmm. and sort of to change that conversation so that we can actually start to talk about violence that happens to queer and trans people? Yeah, yeah, because in the language a lot you'll see, oh, it's like violence against women, and so here are services for women, but then that kind of ignores that a lot of other people who aren't women of all genders experience violence. And I think that one way to make language more inclusive is to, um, I mean, I, is to say like, you're, you're giving services to women, yes, but other people are also welcome. Like it's, it's, it's an inclusive thing, not just for women, um, also not just for men or women. It's like, it's for everybody Yeah, like accessible. A, so I'm thinking like specifically about like, so how we're read in the street. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, like, you know, like trans people might not be read as, you know, the gender that they are. It's just simply through, I guess, a very, like, you know, a traditional view of what gender is. Mm. It's like, um, like they'd be subjected to um, like harassment that yeah, it actually doesn't align with, with who they are. Mm -hmm. And it can be like a very specific kind of harassment mm -hmm. that trans and non-binary or gender diverse people can, can experience. And just yeah. like being misread in the street. Yeah, I think so too. I think expanding um, like what are, what are the definitions of violence and what counts as violence, right? Because for trans and gender non-conforming people that might be like being misgendered in the street or being followed and feeling extremely unsafe because you know what might happen um, and being open to addressing that as forms of violence. Yeah. yeah, and for it to be like, I guess, if that becomes part of the public conversation, mm -hmm. then I feel like as a trans person, like I feel like my experiences of violence are being reflected in a public conversation. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's like, yeah, just not spoken about, it's yeah. like you'll be reading this article and it's just like, well, I don't really know how that, like the framework of women and girls, for instance, mm -hmm. is like, well, what about, you know, what about non-binary people? What mm -hmm. about queer people who are not out? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's like, that's one, one of the biggest things is that like so many queer people like can't express their real gender, like their, their truth, I guess, in a mm -hmm. public space because of that threat. So yeah, it's unsafe for them. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of speaks to how um, the way that queer people do present themselves or trans people do present themselves can be limited sometimes by the binary and by what society expects. And um, you wrote in Vice 
back in 2015, something that I think that most cisgender people don't think about. Um, you wrote that normativity dictates who and what gets wide mainstream attention, but these cover stories are not the real trans experience. There's nothing glamorous about the erasure, poverty, poverty, and murder that define our experiences and permeate our communities. This is what annoys trans folk about our much talked about visibility, this tipping point, it's so edited. So my question to you is, what are your thoughts on passing versus visibility, like presenting yourself and having people see that um, yeah. for, for someone like, like you who does not conform to your gender assigned at birth? How do you perceive passing conformity and normativity? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of it still like remains true. I mean, like I'm, you know, like, yeah, I'm transgender, but I'm also like gender non-conforming in a sense that I'm not, I, I'm not really trying to conform to traditional notions of binary gender mm -hmm. of like, you know, of, of like what a woman should look like, you know, or, or, or the way that femininity should be performed mm -hmm. or the way that masculinity should be performed. And f for me, it's just kind of like, um, yeah, I, I really like to blur that mm -hmm. because I, I do like to kind of, um, you know, I guess like find that space in between, mm -hmm. that liminal space in which I can sort of occupy gender. There's sometimes I, I want to be like hyper feminine. There's sometimes I do still want to be masculine as well. So, mm -hmm. but sometimes I have to, in order to be safe, yeah, sometimes like if I'm passing through an airport, I totally have to think about, am I passing? If I'm about to go through border security, mm -mm. or if I'm about to go into a public bathroom at a shopping center, or if I'm you know, at a football stadium or something like that, mm -hmm. I'm aware that people around me have a perception, they're reading me in a certain way, and I kind of have to be realistic about how that perception affects my, my personal safety. Mm -hmm. So those places are like, they're really public spaces where I have very little control over how my gender is understood or how it's perceived. So mm -hmm. I feel as if, yeah, like I've got to wear my hair down or I've, you know, I've, there are certain things, but like I don't owe femininity to anybody. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 I think we're just like living our authentic self, you know, yeah, and we're just yeah. sort of like living our best life in that sense, yeah. you know? Well, it's interesting that you bring up perform because at least for me I, I personally think that gender is a performance <laughs> like whether you're cis or trans or whatever absolutely yeah 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 and so it's interesting that that's that performance is linked to safety like how normal you appear and the spaces that you that you're in that you you have to perform in yeah um because it's like like the last thing I want to do is be misread I know that people are going to misread me. You know, there are people who do mis misread me and immediately they go, I'm sorry. And there are people who misread me and go, I'm not sorry. Mm. Um, I, I, no one should be freaked out about seeing a trans woman or a trans man or like a non-binary person. Like that stuff should all just be so commonplace. Mm -hmm. Like this idea that we're a threat to someone's safety or rights. Mm. There's no evidence to support it yet it's something that we're constantly having to deal with in this sort of abstract debate that we come up against mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um it's like we're just trying to live our lives <laughs> well, well like i said we're just trying to live our best life yeah. and like and that's it's as, it's as simple as that i feel like the only thing we're threatening is the patriarchy but that should go down anyway like trans people are threatening is, is the, the patriarchy oh it's absolutely stable gender binary and and yeah and you know and the family unit and right, all right. of these things and yeah um yeah people are just like super afraid of that but there's just like there's nothing to be afraid of uh, alan, alan vega he's like he was the front person for uh, suicide, suicide. Yeah. like that like this sort of like an electro electronic punk band from the 70s like the, the whole very minimal sound okay let's do another uh, slight clap here oh okay three two one Awesome. Oh. I was about to clap on the one. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We don't even do that in music. I don't know why that would happen. It was like when I'm getting here and I'm like, it's the second station. No, it's two stops. And it was like, does that mean I get off at the third stop? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I think you have to go back. Someone needs to explain that to you. <laughs> and this was just me getting warmed up yeah, yeah, yeah. back into this. I understand. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> 
so okay like one of the uh, you know one of the really big sort of upholding forces of the gender binary mm -hmm. the repressive gender binary is like data collection oh sorry as we say in the states um data collection <laughs> um but in australia yeah data collection but anyway maybe do you think there's a way i could say that in between the two accents da da data nope. <laughs> data <laughs> So data collection, that would be one way to say it. Data collection. So I guess like the way that the census, you know, sort of says, are you male or female? Um, which for a lot of us, that's a really impossible question to answer when they only let us sort of tick one box out of two. Um, so like data collection continually fails to adequately assess uh, or represent transgender and um, gender diverse people. But um, LGBTIQA organisations, public health organisations particularly, like their data collection, they often kind of reflect a non-binary cohort of around about 50%. Mm. And I always look at that and go, that's actually huge. That's really big. Um, but I think it sort of brings up the idea of administrative transphobia and how um, data collection can erase particularly non-binary people. Um, and so people will be like, well, you know, like, what's the point? Like, you know, they're under like 1%. Like, why would we do that? Well, I've heard that before. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, and given that the business model of architecture and indeed academia as well, sort of relies on data or relies on evidence. Like how important is visibility of non-binary people in filling that gap in representation, in data and in research? Yeah, it's almost like a life and death situation to me. Yeah. I mean, it's similar to the way that you were describing being physically visible and having people see you. It's also very important, like vitally important for pe people to be visible within data as well. Because if you don't exist in the data, it's like you don't yeah. really exist, especially in architecture and other and the census and other data collecting um, and where decisions are made based off of that. Um, so I think that the frameworks for uh, for gathering that data should really be rethought because when you when you have to choose between male and female and it's not even an option to put non-binary it's just like do I leave it blank like yeah. do I just choose one do I like whichever one I want like it does it really matter um, I think that surveys and spreadsheets really abstract a person's life already like it it turns a person's experiences into like check boxes and percentages and stuff like that and then so it's even, even easier to get buried and get erased because it's, it's harder to quantify or even qualify that experience, the trans experience or the non-binary experience into a set of graphs and charts and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also believe that it goes beyond diversity. There's a lot of talk of like, oh, like if we, there's a certain percentage of like trans people we need to meet or a certain percentage of like it needs to be racially diverse somehow, but I think it goes beyond diversity and goes toward representation, where it's like, it's great if there's a person there, but if they're not represented in the data, then the, then you don't really have diversity or representation at all. Yeah. And I, like if there's non-binary people that I know of in the profession who are like, how is this conversation around equity representing me? Like, mm -hmm. th like there will be conversations about um, you know, the pay gap. Mm -hmm. Or there'll be conversations about, you know, who has, you know, who has agency or, or, or who has executive power. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if those surveys aren't including where non-binary people, or even kind of like where trans women or trans men are actually mm -hmm. fitting. Like, I, yeah, and even if it is like a small number, it's still important to really know what that is. Yeah. Um, what I think about is I've, I've had cisgender women say like, oh, we can we can talk about trans rights and in the workplace and stuff like that after we've won women's rights. And it's like, for some reason, if we include trans people like in studies about pay gaps, it'll somehow like dilute the the statistics or something like that. But the way that I see it is if you're focusing on the most marginalized and the people who are most underrepresented, then everyone gets it better as a whole. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially if if like non-binariness gets at the root of 
like men having more power and getting paid more than women and everyone else it's like let's destabilize that you yeah, know if people will I, sit there and go yeah, well I, no like we yeah we want to kind of like women's organizing is really important it's like yeah no women's organizing is so important and so is trans organizing mm -hmm. you know and so is queer organizing and actually like we're all trying to achieve the same thing here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if yeah if we do sort of work intersectionally mm -hmm then we're totally going to achieve that objective and that yeah. objective is for um like you know like a better balance of of views and people in executive power that are representational in that sense mm -hmm. yeah. it'll make us stronger rather than splitting us apart it's not going to weaken us at all yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like i feel like that 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 chasm and that sort of like debating of you know trans legitimacy mm -hmm is actually a chasm like yeah. it is actually like it's division mm -hmm. that that is really unnecessary yeah the way i see it is like visibility whether that's physical visibility or visibility within data is a two-way street it's like you can yeah. present yourself as any way you want to present and know yourself as whatever gender you are but if the other person doesn't recognize that and then respect it then it's there's no visibility involved <laughs> yeah yeah so simona you transitioned while working at an architecture firm. Um, I did. <laughs> yeah. What was that sudden visibility like? Speaking of visibility, how and how are ways that the profession can do better to support trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people through transition? Yeah, like I would have transitioned in architecture. I guess well, it would have been about six years ago. I think it was like every time I started a job somewhere, like through my whole career, I've always been like, if I was, could, could I come out in this studio? Mm -hmm. Like, is this studio gonna be able to mm -hmm. sort of deal with, with that if I feel as if I can make that decision? You know, and um, so eventually that time came and I did. And um, but on the whole, like the place where I was working, like dealt with it pretty well. Like I basically went on holiday for like a month and I came back and um, apparently someone had sat everyone in the studio down and said now like these are Simona's pronouns um, don't get it wrong mm. um, this is this is the, you know the way it'll work and and I think that that really comes from um, I guess like an obligation for to enforce equal opportunity legislation and equal opportunity legislation is something that's super under threat at the moment. Mm. You know, it's, in, it's under threat in the United States, it's under threat um, in Australia with the Religious Freedoms Act. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, I've got to say on the whole, like, like that experience was okay, but what wasn't okay was just the stress of transition, the stress of transitioning publicly. Mm -hmm. And when you've been involved in an industry for like 20 years, and people, people sort of know you as yeah. one person and people are, there were people that just couldn't deal with that change. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that people will outwardly show you. Like, I think there was only one person who like sat me down at, a, at an awards night and went, oh, like I prefer, you know, sort the of old, old Simona and I was just like, <laughs> what? Um, yeah, you don't get an opinion on well, that. Well, <laughs> no, it doesn't. But he, but well, he felt that he had to express it, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like you know, and architects, particularly cis men in architecture, like to express their opinions yes. in that sense, don't they? But um, yeah, even though he probably should have kept his opinions to himself, what that represented, were well, there probably were a lot of opinions like that out there, mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I guess like what I was conscious of was you know, gradually my role over two years, you know, I, I felt like, oh, maybe I'm not being, you know, put in front of the client anymore because, you know, maybe they're uncomfortable with me representing publicly or, but the stress of transition was really difficult. Mm. You know, what was happening outside of life, you know, we've all got life outside. Mm -hmm. Working 60, 70 hours in architecture is hard enough, mm -hmm. you know. But when you're undergoing transition, it's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess it was like, you know, trying to keep those hours and, and, and then just literally kind of thinking like, how am I going to hold onto this job when mm -hmm. like there are some days where I literally can't walk from the 
train station to work because I'm walking like like two places where I work there were like huge building sites mm. and it's strange like I've been on site um, since I've transitioned as a project architect and I've also been on site where I'm just walking past a huge building site and mm. you get treated really really poorly mm -hmm. um, like the amount of harassment yeah the amount of harassment yeah. and there were some days where I just literally just couldn't walk into work um, or I just walked into work like you know just yeah just crying because mm -hmm. um, it so, really takes a toll yeah it really takes a toll and so there's like there's time that you do have to spend off work mm -hmm. um, and I just I just hope that like studio managers can understand that can be proactive I think about being understand that or giving giving some time off like time off to you know like to to see see doctors or to see like mental health professionals and mm -hmm. like there is a bit of time that you do need to take off mm -hmm. can i speak a little bit about my transition yeah because my, mine happened when i was in graduate school and it was i mean all of my cohort like my my uh, fellow students were just like cool like we'll call you al now we'll we'll try our best to use they them um, it was mostly the professors who were like, we don't know what pronouns are. What's a they? What? We'll just call you AL. Yeah. And it was, it was like a steep learning curve for them. Um, but then I've gotten emails from them recently where they're like, we have students now, like multiple students who are non-binary. And so thank you for like putting, planting that seed. <laughs> you know, this cohort of non-binary people that is, mm -hmm. you know, becoming really evident. Um, that's why I think it's like more, it's so important that we, like that has implications for how we design public space. Mm -hmm. and the, like young adults who mm -hmm. are identifying as non-binary. Yeah. Well, in schools, we have to provide spaces for them. Mm -hmm. Like we want kids at school to be safe. So yeah, I think it, people are just starting to realize that too. Yeah, like the profession's got to change. Design standards have to change a bit. I, I guess the more people that meet trans and non-binary people, the more people understand, okay, well, how can I be a better ally? Mm -hmm. And it's just, and it's all about being an ally. Allyship is so important to what this conversation's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Al, your ideas on critique are really great. Okay. Um, and there's this one quote that's, um, do I listen to students, reports, consultants, and clients with the intent to understand or to critique? Um, so I feel like that really exposes how stakeholder engagement processes of architecture are often flawed. You know, designers and planners are taught pretty early on to manage stakeholders rather than engage them, um, particularly if they pose a threat to the brief, like the all-powerful brief, you know. Mm. And then the all-powerful timeline and the budget. All-powerful budget. <laughs> all-powerful budget. And so this is often how particularly, yeah, the trans and gender diverse groups are tokenized and it, ext it extends to many groups. But when it comes to unpacking critique and understanding, how important is the relationship between power and empathy in making architecture a transformative tool of social justice? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. I think as architects, the way we're taught in school is that we have the power to design what we want to design, right? But then that, that means that you think that you already understand it so that when you're critiquing and when you're engaging with the community sometimes you think that you understand better than they do even though they're the ones who are living and experiencing their lives and they're trying to tell you so i think that critique can come from a place where you don't really understand but i think the real power comes in when you when someone does like have empathy and does understand because i think that Empathy is that power to imagine a reality that isn't yours yeah. and to imagine that that is something that other people experience and then using that understanding to inform your design so that it's not about, oh, this design's for my portfolio, it's for my ego, like it's got to look this way. It's more like this design is in service to the community and you have to understand the community before you can actually do that design. Well, I, I think of the saying, I don't know if it's an actual saying, but um, it's a saying that I heard in grad school. It was that form follows capital. And it's almost like architecture is more in service to capital and the funding and the budgets and what the developer follow wants. Follow the money. Yeah, exactly, yeah. follow the money. And that's politics too. Yeah, yeah. And that's like, that's the opposite of having empathy for the community and for really designing contextually so that 
something is a benefit to people's lives rather than something that is a negative impact. Yeah, I feel like sometimes empathy is about stopping the process mm -hmm. and and changing. Yeah, and being able to say, being able to understand what what the community is trying to tell you, and realize that hey, sometimes you can be wrong. Like sometimes your yeah. design isn't the solution. <laughs> and I mean, and you know, I worked at one place that was like, we don't know what we're doing until we're doing it. And I was like, wow, a designer actually said that, and. You know, it's like one of like part of their ethos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I feel like for a lot of firms, and particularly for a lot of developers, that is not an option to even think like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To stop the to, to to stop the clock is like, well, it's you know, how much money are we losing? Right, right. They're well, like listening to the community, but only to formulate a response, and that's yeah. not actual listening. That's not actual understanding. But it's also building. It's bad architecture. That's bad development. Yeah. Because it's know. to maximize the amount of space that you can rent. Or to get it done on time. That, uh, you know, on time, yeah. on budget, like, you know. Wow. We're just not very neoliberal, are we? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was inviting us to speak about architecture as a social justice practice. So, like, why would I possibly care about sitting here and give a shit? <laughs> about that anyway um <laughs> smash the state beer um <laughs> anything else no yeah so following on from following on from that um in medium in 2016 you wrote my transgender non-binary gender identity is in fact not new I'm, I'm who I've always been. My transformation is but an amalgamation and a progression of who I was, am and will be. Being a non-binary person does not mean that I do not exist. So people often see trans and gender diverse individuals they know as, or meet, sort of see them through transition, as if it's like this singular event, like we were talking before, like we'll give you four weeks off mm -hmm. and you'll come back no worries, you know, like, it, and it just absolutely doesn't work like that. Like, tra transition is ongoing. Um, it's not a moment in time. If architecture is about the human condition, how might understanding transition, indeed transformation, as this symposium is called, understanding that as amalgamation mm -hmm. and progression, rather than this sort of binary threshold of this or, or that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the way that I think about transformation and transition and things being an amalgamation is that change doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen over four weeks sometimes. It's something that continually happens, as you said, um, like change is the constant. And as our knowledge changes and as our understanding changes, our institutions should progress as well. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we are able to change and that change is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's, it's really caught up in the ego too, like mm -hmm. how you keep changing your mind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, we want certainty, like certainty is like just so big and, and, and certainty is about the black and white. Mm -hmm. Certainty is about, you know, I don't know. Like sometimes when I look at a forward slash, if I see like M forward slash F for instance, I'm like, Wow, that forward slash is an entire universe. Mm -hmm. But like the way that people would read, like the M and the F is like, wow, there's just like everything's on the other side of that. And it's like, no, it's like, right. let's, let's, live in the, let's live in the forward slash. Right. <laughs> Simona, your memoir in The Guardian back in 2015, you wrote candidly about finding support and belonging in music. And this is a quote, I found friendship, community and access. Each dinner, each performance, each DJ set, each discussion, each tagged selfie on Instagram seems like a social revolution. <laughs> I have a sense of belonging and self-worth I never believed I would find on my darkest Saturday nights, watching rage in my mid-30s with a terrible sense of failure I thought that was worth killing myself over. That, those are heavy words, but very real. That's a grim, isn't it? Yeah. So in, in your experience, what do queerness, 
and being trans and activism, music, and spatial design have to do with one another? And how do they influence the way that you think about design and architecture? Yeah, well, well Rage is this, you know, okay, so Rage is a music program that like starts at midnight and finishes at eight in the morning. Oh, wow. And you watch it until you fall asleep. And like, they'll have like, they'll have, they'll have like every video from your favorite band and they'll do like a special, you know. So I used to watch that a lot. Um, and be like, I want my music video on Rage, you know. <laughs> um, and you're asking me, well, because I, you know, transitioned in architecture, and I, I did find architecture, the profession, like a really, I did find it a hostile space. Mm. I don't find music as much as a hostile space. But I've always felt that, like, um, trying to articulate a, some really profound, some really deep emotions about architecture. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to try and do that, like, like urbanism, the queer city. Like, how do I kind of articulate that experience? And I've always loved how music can do that. Mm. Um, music as a soundtrack, music as a narrative. And music is a really great way to communicate effective conditions. Mm -hmm. It's also a really great place to find empathy um, and to find a very different understanding of, of, of these emotions. Um, you know, about how like the body passes through space, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. Yeah, that sounds very um, architectural. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and like, you know, like the way that the body moves, like, okay, the, we think of dance or we think of anything else, but um, you know, like, the, the evolution of the queer city mm -hmm. has come from partying. Mm -hmm. Like taking, and then that, that's always been a really risky thing. Like, I, like queer occupation of cities has always been born out of risk. It's always been born out of trying to, I guess, find that space of some kind of comfortability that's in a very hostile space. So yeah, I almost kind of feel like the way that I've gone about being a performer and a musician or throwing like queer parties has been like this sort of like we're taking over a space very temporarily mm -hmm. spaces that we don't own mm -hmm. um, that we have to set up and bump out you know pretty quickly on a really low budget um, so there's a quite a strange sense of permanence mm -hmm. or impermanence mm -hmm. to that you know, it's like if I was ever performing a show, like it was like, yeah, something like I'd sort of like set up on stage and then take out. So in terms of like planning that event in space, mm -hmm. I always considered that to be, that always sort of sounded like I needed to like bring about an architectural solution mm -hmm. to that or a logistical mm -hmm. solution to that. Um, and so performance and sound and lighting and all of those things just became like a really big, big part of that practice. It sounds like a different way to practice architecture and it's almost like it cr music creates the conditions for you to practice architecture in a very specific way. But I, nightclubs and festivals are absolutely mm -hmm. microcosms of community. They're microcosms mm -hmm. of society, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like the way that we run events, mm -hmm. you know, and in, and in you know, in, um, in the musical community in Melbourne, for instance, and, and a lot of other musical communities around the world, it's like, well, how do we make these places safer? Mm -hmm. And we can't make them completely safe, but how do we make them safer? How do we make them more inclusive? Mm -hmm. um, how do we make like, you know, uh, retreat spaces or bathroom spaces, mm -hmm. you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. How do we make these places accessible mm -hmm. for, you know, for people who are neurodiverse, for people who you know are in wheelchairs or mm -hmm. yeah, anything like that. So and that seems like something that can be translated to the bigger city, like yeah. Well, scale. it's like some of the you know some of the things that we've been trying to do in you know raves in warehouses in Footscray, mm -hmm. you know in in the you know in Melbourne, you know essentially what we've been trying to do with those things like they've made their way into policy documents mm. in sport in music 
even like the office of prime minister and cabinet, for mm -hmm. instance, like, um, you know, how we would sort of note, you know, the way that toilets can be used or, you know, who can identify to use those spaces. So, mm. um, yeah, I feel like you're just sort of running these events as sort of inform that a hell of a lot too mm -hmm. um but yeah and and like and, and also like being on the stage like it's such a resistive um expression but it's also really celebratory as well but mm. like that has such a ingrained part of the the evolution of the queer city mm -hmm. and of queer community and and gathering and of you know as, as much as it's about trying to find you know people that you're in the same music into the same music and also like wanting to dance or whatever but it's also about like hooking up and it's about mm -hmm. sex and it's about you know like what am i going to wear tonight how mm -hmm. am i going to perform yeah. my yes. you know my, how am i going to perform my gender tonight yeah. you know all that sort of stuff as well yeah talking about being on stage and visibility like you're really extremely visible when you're on stage yeah it's like for me it's like the stage is safer and more comfortable than here we are in you know broad daylight public space having a conversation you know <laughs> which i think is sort of you know why i think doing this is sort of like super powerful for mm. you know for like queer people to, to be in public space and, and and talking about this stuff Great. <laughs> Goodness for that. Which chair? That I'll one. take this side. Okay. Because like a jackhammer started just as soon as we started to talk and I was just sitting there. That's why I said um and like sort of thing a lot because that jackhammer was going and I'm going, if I come back with a jackhammer, my God. Sorry. That's me. Okay, good. Thank you. It was great. Hello. I'm Alison Cleary, by the way. Um, you already know Simona. Um, it was fabulous. How does it feel being back on, in Melbourne? Uh, great, you know. <laughs> oh, great. New York great. was sensational, of course. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. But yeah, I was like, where are we going to film that? And it was just so, New York is so noisy between like helicopters, dog shitting, sirens you know, the wind of the river. Oh, it's gorgeous. It was very, yeah, it was great. And Ayo was the most amazing person. So, yeah, thanks for sending me over to meet them because they were awesome. Great. And um, I am here to ask questions of Simona because I'm not even going to attempt to fill the space that Ayo created. They were amazing as well. Yeah, that was brilliant. Um, one of the things that um, you did touch upon but I'm sure lots of people um, here who are practitioners would, would very much like to know a little bit more around. And um, if, you, if, you, you know, if you can give some pointers, is the whole issue about how, how can um, the profession and your colleagues in the profession in the, within the built environment, how can they best support um, trans and, and um, non-binary, gender non-conforming colleagues and also communities? How can they support them to live their best lives, in the, as you put it? Well, as individuals who are designers, um, give us jobs. Um, you know, even like the issues that are happening at the University of Melbourne, for instance, around, I guess, um, you know, some, some of the debate, I guess, around trans legitimacy. It's like, well, if trans people are kind of working in the organisation, then there's people within the organisation who can make those changes and, you know, can inform, I guess, the policy. Well, that's my earring. That's better. Um, so um, in architecture, it's much the same thing. It's like, if we're going to have conversations about bathrooms, don't have an all cis panel to sit and talk about it. Um, trans people should be leading that conversation. And when trans people are leading that conversation, non-binary people are leading that conversation, 
then not only are those people probably getting paid to sit there, you know, and they have a job, but they're also reflecting the needs of the community that we live within. So for me, that representation at the design table is, not only does it serve individuals, it serves the community as well. Like, we're the best uh, people to have a conversation with if you want to know those things. So ask us. Okay. That leads into my next question, and we've talked about this, which is, um, um, and you, you work across a number of industries, I guess, a number of um, creative fields. So you work within the built environment profession, you work within the music industry. Uh, who's doing it well? You don't I need to know I, names. I, well, no, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> We've talked about being sued already today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, architects love to sue. Um, so I think who's doing it well? I mean, I, I think that LGBTIQA organisations are obviously leading it really well. Um, and I did sort of cite health, um, queer health organisations as doing it quite well. But f there have been policy documents that have been released, particularly the Australian Human Rights Commission, have worked really well with the trans and gender diverse community to come up with a policy document that is how the sport how the Australian sporting community and all their clubs and all their associations can better engage and involve and include trans and gender diverse people because it has, not only does it have direct effect on, you know, our participation in community, but it also has a direct effect on our mental health. Like, like the, you know, like that mental health outcomes for trans and gender diverse people are some of the worst in the country. So participation in sport, that's one thing. Participation in music is another thing. So, you know, with Music Victoria, I've just been recently writing the gender diversity guidelines for live music venues. So, yeah, a lot of that work that we have been doing at the Tote or in raves or wherever is totally finding their way into really big festivals. And so that policy document you know, is one way, but it's, it's about how these things can intervene into the architectural brief. If the architectural brief excludes non-binary people, or ex it doesn't even think that trans or gender diverse people are part of the cohort or part of the client group, then it's not going to serve those people. And yeah, like there's an emerging group, but there's also trans people that exist now. There are trans people in their 90s, 80s. You know, mid 40s. So this idea that we're sort of emerging, well, we're here and we've always been here. Trans and gender diverse people have been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, you mentioned toilets before. I know it's something people always love to talk about in this context. Cis people like to talk they about toilets. They love talking about toilets and yeah. they're like, how do we solve Trans people toilets? just want to go to I just to want to go toilet. to the toilet, hey. yep. Yeah, you know. um, I just want to use it. It's not a topic of conversation. Um, <laughs> it's, I should call it cis bathroom panic, but not. But yeah. it, it's fascinating how you know this whole th fixation on toilets is that we all do the two things anyway. Um, gender neutral spaces, not just toilets. Is it is it just you know is it just fancy palaver? Is it what is it? Is it bullshit? Gender neutral spaces? <laughs> um, no, it's not bullshit. The idea that we live in a post-gender utopia is, 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 is not true. Like, you know, the thing that stuffs up the idea of gender-neutral design is patriarchy. You know, I've, I know a guy who was like, oh, you know, I've just gone into the gender-neutral bathrooms and taken up all the space. And I'm like, you are the so the problem. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to share a bathroom with you. No one wants to share a bathroom with you, actually. Um, so I'm not sure if gender neutrality is the problem, because gender neutral design and gender neutral space in queer spaces actually works really well, because it gives rise to a variety of gender expressions. But gender neutral design in a patriarchal space is only the, the patriarchy is just going to come in and take that over. It becomes so, a target. Yeah, well, they just want to occupy space, take up yeah. space, all that yeah. stuff. So yeah. I'm not sure if saying that gender, new, uh, you know, saying that gender neutral design um, uh, philosophies or anything like that, they're not inherently bad, but they can't be applied to every single situation either. So 
For me, it is about non-binary. It is about understanding the diversity of gender that does exist and creating spaces that give rise to, to those conditions. Okay, yeah. One of the, um, a, a quote of yours, and this comes into this in terms of hostile spaces as opposed to safe spaces, um, you wrote um, that queerness is often about taking risks to find some degree of safety and about belonging within hostile spaces. And we've talked about that notion of um, um, the very different distinction between actually having a sense of belonging and safety versus being allowed to be somewhere and that, a difference in that. And I just wonder how, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a woman, I know how that manifests for me, what that means in terms of space um, and particularly public space. I wonder how does that manifest for you in terms of, you know, moving through what um, is an incredibly hostile space for, for gender non-conforming and trans people. And I, you know, we, you talked about on the film about going through airports, things like that. Um, I mean, how, how does that, and I guess also in the music space, you talked about what, it like, what it's like in the music space. But uh, are there any other examples you can give? Is there anything else you want to add to that in terms of you know, how, how occupying what are quite hostile spaces and how you get that safety? Uh, well, I think sometimes feminism can be a hostile space. I think um, lesbian spaces are a hostile space towards trans women. I think trans misogyny, um, I invite you to Google that or whatever your preferred search engine is. Um, but trans misogyny, which is the intersection, okay, I'll, I'll explain it, it's the intersection of misogyny and transphobia and how that plays out for us in political organising in the workplace. Uh, in sexual spaces is, um, yeah, is really difficult. Um, so how that translates into an architectural sense, it's, yeah, it's like the station. It's, you know, trams and, and the way that, I mean, you know, public transport's frightening. I just, you know, I'll just, I've pretty much just going to get spat on like at least once every six months. And that's, that comes out of a disgust. Like that trans misogyny is a very different kind of hostility to, to any other kind of hostility. And, you know, it's Trans Day of Remembrance next week and I've just been in the United States. Well, you know, in the United States, there's about two or three trans women, particularly trans women of colour, who are murdered every month. We've had a trans woman of colour murdered in Australia in September and mainstream media didn't even pick it up. So the value of our lives, that for a lot of people they have no value of our existence and our life, and let alone the contribution that we could possibly make to architecture or any other profession for in, in that sense, that's where the hostility really comes from. So that's something that I have to mentally prepare for every time I get out of bed, and I'm really tired of that. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Pretty shit, really. It's like putting on the armor every day. Yeah, how's my um, how's my how's my sort of black, black going today? <laughs> it's great. I had to lose an earring though. But um, yeah, so yeah. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions in the audience. Do we have any questions? We've got a couple of questions. Thank you, Simona, um, for opening up so beautifully and for being here and sharing your experience. It was wonderful. Um, I have a question about the kind of forward slash that you were talking about in, um, in the conversation. And I think it's a really powerful space and I think it's something that you're going to understand better than almost anyone else. Um, and it's kind of a technical question, but I wonder how that sort of space of what the forward slash represents could be brought into a design process or into practice so we can kind of open up the way practice works to kind of embrace that blurriness and embrace the kind of fuzziness to allow us to really connect with the brief, the people, the community, whatever it is. Yeah, um, I, I think of a, yeah, I, if, if a forward slash is how liminal space is represented in typography, then in architecture and on the plan, that's represented by the threshold, 
which is literally the line that we might draw between one room and another or one zone and another. And, you know, it will be like a choice between do we put carpet and concrete on the other side? And I'm just kind of like, oh, but maybe I live in that little aluminium seam. <laughs> there, maybe that's like... Because this is where borders are enforced, right? Oh, you can be there, oh, you can't be there. This is, this is where surveillance is enforced and this is where, you know, people are prohibited from being in one space or another. So if your gender is under surveillance, if you are a non-compliant body in an airport, in a shopping centre, you're immediately deemed as suspicious. So I like to critique how the threshold the way we think about it in an architectural sense, how is that threshold a way that upholds this binary so that there are people who live in that forward slash who are just, we have to make a choice between male or female, or that we're just being read by other people as male or female when, when, when that's not necessarily the case. I'm interested in how the architectural brief upholds that, and my work is about breaking that. Thanks. I love the forward slash concept. It's, it articulates so much. It was fantastic. I think it might be my next tattoo. I think it's a good one. I think it'd be great. But I'm not sure what to put on either, either side. side yeah. <laughs> um, there was one more question. Oh, I had another question up here, and then there's one there. Have I got enough time for two more questions? Or just one? One more. Okay. Just one more question. So it was this person up here. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was great to hear someone talking so honestly. Um, my question is about um, reporting and data and how sometimes data is so empowering but sometimes it's dangerous. Um, in architectural practices, should we be asking you to tick a box, male, female? And, and what is, so we've, we've, we were discussing what our boxes should be. Should we have boxes? What, what should they be? And I think currently we're, we're male, female, uh, both, I don't know, what is it, male, female, neither, and prefer not to say, <laughs> which we're kind of uncomfortable with because there's no, we're like, what is the right answer and should we be asking at all? Well, if, there's a, if you're asking because you want to actively understand your cohort of trans and gender diverse people, then by all means, please do that. Um, but if you're going to say, like at Melbourne University, male, female, transgender, I can only tick... You can only tick one box, so I can't tell the university that I'm transgender and female. And so I've got to choose between the two. So, well, I, I want to show up in the, in the data that I'm trans because I want my cohort to be represented, but that almost like enforces the essence of trans-exclusionary radical feminism, which is you can't be trans and woman, or you can't be trans and a man. So. The idea of ticking multiple boxes is probably a really good start. Um, also, like, why are you asking, you know? And also, like, give the option to tick non-binary as well. There's a lot more options than just that. So, um, I'm all for, you know, people asking. But again, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm also like, is the institution even going to use that information well? Like institutions don't really look after minorities anyway, so... But is, is there a point where we don't need to know? Are we focused too much on gender? Can we just be people at some point? Well, we still have to be conscious that we all, we're, we're under oppression and we're under violence and some hostility and, and that that relationship is, is gendered. But I think that that shouldn't uphold the existing binary. I think we've got to be, un we've got to understand that there are very different ways that gender, is, uh, sorry, that, that violence happens towards um, different genders. And sometimes, yeah, I think the box ticking exercise is a way that upholds the, 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 the existing conversation. So, yeah, break it down. That's great. Just one last question. Where's your next performance at? When you, I noticed you were DJing at... Um, no, no, at Music Week. Am I right? 
No, um, I'm not sure actually. Uh, Golden Plains or something. Okay, I'm just trying know, to get. You, I'm just trying to. Yeah. Oh, you're trying to plug. I'm trying, the, to, yeah. I'm trying to plug. Buy the album. Yeah, yeah. Buy the buy album. A t-shirt. Yeah, get the book. Oh, Thank you. The book's going to be great. The book's going to be great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Simona. And thank you very much. Al in their absence. Thanks, Al. <laughs>